In my last video, I talked about the effects geographic isolation can have on animals, specifically birds like the dodo, which lost their ability to fly. And well, this got me thinking a lot about penguins. You see, calling Antarctica home, penguins inhabit what is in many ways not only the most isolated environment, but also the most extreme environment on the planet, and one which wholly belongs to these birds. As a result, penguins have adapted to the freezing conditions of their home to a degree that few animals ever get the chance to do, making them what can only be described as the most cold, resilient animals in the world. But the Earth is home to not one, but two polar regions, with more or less the same environmental conditions in the North as are found in the South. By all measures, penguins should be able to not only survive, but thrive in the Arctic, just as they do in the Antarctic. But, well, they don't. To understand why this is, we need to return to the field of insular biogeography and learn more about the evolution, the natural history, and yeah, even the human history of these amazing birds. Just like our last video, to start understanding penguins, we need to first take a look at their native habitat. Except this time, things aren't so simple as they were when we looked at dodos, which called just a single island their home. No, penguins are a much broader ranging bird, holding an entire continent under their domain, with a natural history that extends back 60 million years. By this time, the world looked like this, with all the continents we know today having separated from one another, but still weren't quite in the same places as they are now. As this breakup of the world's many landmasses carried on, one small piece of continental crust slipped away from the southernmost lands consisting of Australia and Antarctica. This continental fragment would eventually become New Zealand, as well as the Greater Zealandia Shelf. Having become isolated before the reign of mammals, this would have been a collection of islands devoid of predators, and completely out of reach for any that might eventually evolve elsewhere. This left Proto-Zealand accessible only to birds, which could fly in from surrounding lands, filling these islands with plenty of forms for evolution to experiment with. Just as we've seen before, isolation on a bountiful island devoid of large predators affects animals in similar ways. And just like how the dodo grew big and lost its ability to fly, a similar evolution took place here, producing the Weimanu, the common ancestor of all penguins. Except, unlike dodos, these birds gave up their ability to fly in exchange for an exceptional ability to swim, allowing these Weimanu penguins to quickly colonize surrounding lands, and over the next 20 million years diversified into at least 40 different species distributed all across the South Pole. New Zealand saw species like the Kairuku and the Kumimanu. Peru featured Sphensis muizoni and Ichidiptes, and Nguza penguins took over southern Africa. At the heart of this community of swimming birds, however, was Antarctica. By this time, high sea levels had reduced the continent into a collection of islands, the perfect setting for an island bird to dominate. And when I say dominate, I mean dominate, as it'd be here that we'd find the greatest examples of island gigantism within the penguin family, Paleodiptes klekowskii and Anthropornis nordenskjoldii, both inhabited what would eventually become the Antarctic Peninsula, but more accurately could be referred to as the Antarctic Island at this time. For their great success in this arena, these Antarctic creatures grew up to 5 feet or 1.5 meters tall, or about as tall as some people, and 5 foot 9 or 1.7 meters, which is taller than most people. I mean, just think about that for a second. Not only were these birds bigger than humans, but having lost the ability to fly also meant they no longer needed to be lightweight, meaning they could reach weights of over 200 pounds or 90 kilograms. These would have been absolutely insane animals to meet in the wild, and I feel like no one talks about the fact that they just ruled a part of this planet for a while. Altogether, this community of giant penguins prospered throughout the South Pole, literally forming a club penguin corner of the world. But around 40 million years ago, the Earth started to change. What had, until this point, been a warm, forested land gradually started to build up ice. 
In a matter of only a few million years, glaciers poured over the southern landmasses and the Earth entered its most recent ice age. Like any drastic change in climate, many animals were not prepared, including most penguins, driving nearly all of them to extinction. When all was said and done, nearly every plant and animal that had ever called Antarctica home had been wiped off the face of the Earth and buried under miles of ice. Well, that is, except for a single species. A penguin whose seafaring nature had taught it about managing body heat to the point where it could adapt to the changing climate, just enough to eke out an existence on the ice. It would be from these sole Antarctic survivors that all modern day penguins would delineate from, turning this frozen continent into the new mainland for penguins to expand and recolonize from. Though with the continents drifting further and further apart, these new colonies of penguins became more and more isolated from one another, leading to a new wave of penguin speciation. In their Antarctic isolation, island gigantism once again bred for larger birds, this time with the added benefit of helping to keep warm, resulting in the emperor penguin, the largest modern species, which can reach up to heights of over 4 feet, which okay is still pretty damn big. These are joined by the Adelie penguin, a much smaller member of the family that together make up the two endemic species of Antarctica. From here, penguins spread to the south coast of Africa, where they've been isolated long enough to become the Cape penguin. But just like how small animals can grow larger when in isolation, large animals like the penguins of Antarctica can also grow smaller when in the same conditions, a trend known as island dwarfism. This explains the emergence of the blue penguin across Australia and New Zealand, which is, yeah, the smallest species of penguin around today. And okay, we gotta take a break just to look at a few more pictures of these guys because just look at them. I mean, how am I only now learning about these? Okay, so the southern coasts of both Africa and Australia are home to a single penguin species each, which okay, isn't all that much, but that also makes sense, considering Africa is nearly 4,000 kilometers away, while Australia is closer to 3,000. Remember, the rate and success of colonization decreases the further away colonies are from the mainland. That's why it's around Antarctica's closest neighbor, South America, that will find the highest rate of colonization, and by extension, speciation. The islands stretching out from the Antarctic Peninsula serve as a sort of bridge for penguins to swim between, resulting in large populations of king penguins, gentoo penguins, chinstrap penguins, macaroni penguins, and rockhopper penguins all sharing these islands. But those lucky birds that eventually found the southern tip of America gained access to a whole new coastline to colonize, over time producing Magellanic penguins down around Patagonia and Humboldt penguins all the way up the coast to Peru. But the deeper these penguins colonized this true continent, the more their island tameness, namely their poor ability to move around on land, becomes an issue for survival. You see, this is where large animals begin to spill over from the Amazon. Predators like jaguars and pumas prevent the successful progress of penguins any further up the coast. The only places further north that don't force the immediate local extinction of any colonizing penguins would be more islands, where predators have yet to reach. This explains why the northernmost outpost of the penguin genus can be found out here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on the Galapagos Islands. Here, the Galapagos penguin has adapted to the tropical climate, becoming the only member of the penguin family to actually live north of the equator. So again, this all begs the question, if penguins were able to make it all the way to the tropics far outside of their typical climatic comfort zone, then why haven't they been able to make it the rest of the way to the Arctic, back to an environment that they're actually best suited for? And well, to be honest, there are two answers to this question, the happy one and the sad one. Which one do you want to hear first? The happy one? Okay, sure, the happy one. In the last video, we learned the two major components for insular biogeography were simply colonization and extinction. What we're talking about here has to do with colonization. In that video, we also learned that the main determining factor of colonization is how far an island, or in our case the Arctic, is away from the mainland, or in our case the Antarctic. 
But if you couldn't tell just by their names, the Arctic and the Antarctic just so happen to be positioned exactly opposite from one another, literally at different ends of the Earth. Or in other words, these two environments are as far away from each other as is possible. This means the rate of colonization from either side to the other is going to be lower than just about anywhere else on the planet. But still, this doesn't mean the rate of colonization is necessarily zero. And as we can see from examples like the Galapagos penguins, there is a fair amount of incentive for penguins to push forward and find new fishing grounds to take advantage of. But doing this, penguins run into another problem. You see, colonizing across an east-west axis is relatively easy, as it's possible to stay within the same climate zone, meaning a minimal number of adaptations need to take place when moving from one area to the next. But thanks to their geography, the north-south direction penguins need to move in means migrating from polar to subpolar to temperate to subtropical to tropical, back to subtropical, back to temperate, back to subpolar, and finally back to polar, each step along the way requiring adaptations to the changing environment. Now, to be fair, we can see that penguins have actually been moving in this direction, but adapting to literally every single climate zone takes time, and so by this point they've only managed to make it into the tropics. But you see, evolution is always an exchange, and so each time a penguin adapts to a new climate, this means it partially loses adaptations to the climate of the Antarctic. In order to cope with the intense heat of the tropics, for example, Galapagos penguins have developed feet flippers that are good at exchanging heat with the air and ground, so that when they shade their feet with their bodies, they help discharge excess body heat. While this surely makes living near the equator more tolerable, it makes living at the poles more intolerable, and could even lead to their feet getting frostbite, ultimately killing them. So, as penguins climb closer and closer to the Arctic, they end up losing what would have allowed them to thrive in the Arctic in the first place, a problem I think I'm going to call the penguin paradox. And so, unless two penguins, a male and a female, can make the 20,000 kilometer long trip across the ocean directly from Antarctica to the Arctic, then the North Pole will remain off limits for the time being. But okay, besides the incredible distance and multiple climate zones that need to be crossed, both of which being obstacles to colonization, there are also forces present at the North Pole that make survival here much harder than in the South, namely predators, or what would more broadly be described as vectors for extinction. Here, animals like arctic fox, arctic wolves, and polar bears take advantage of any animal not fast enough to escape their pursuit, which pretty much would be every single penguin that ever managed to make its way here. These two factors, a low colonization rate thanks to geography, and a high rate of extinction thanks to biology make the Arctic virtually untouchable, greeting any and all incoming penguins with a swift and immediate death. Okay, so believe it or not, that was the happy answer. If you're satisfied with that, hey, don't feel like you gotta stick around. Just like the video, subscribe, support me on Patreon, and I'll see you next time. But if you wanna know the real reason why there are no penguins in the Arctic, then let me ask you, what makes you so sure there isn't already a northern equivalent to the penguin? That's right, allow me to introduce you to the great auk. While the Arctic and Northern Atlantic are home to numerous birds within the Alcid family, including many familiar birds like puffins, murrelets, guillemots, and even little auklets, only one of them, the great auk, got so good at hunting fish that it gave up its wings entirely in exchange for flippers. This makes the great auk the only true northern equivalent to penguins, and if you didn't know better, it'd be easy to assume this was a penguin. And well, actually it is, but also very much not. Let me explain. Both being inhabitants of essentially the same environment with the same freezing temperatures to fight against and the same productive cold water ocean to hunt in, evolution has molded these two creatures into nearly identical forms. 
But don't be fooled, the great auks are only distantly related to penguins, about as much as any two random birds are related. And the similarities shared between them are instead an amazing example of what's called convergent evolution. Everything from their coloration to their size, their shape, all aspects of their physiology was crafted twice by evolution to fit the same ecological niche. In fact, it was these similarities in both appearance and behavior that made the Europeans who first witnessed flightless birds when exploring the Antarctic think of similar birds they had back home. Mistaking these southern swimming birds as direct relatives of the great auk, they were named based on the auk's Latin title, <laughs> Penguinus impenis. Which, other than being, of course, hilarious, means that the great auk was actually the original penguin and that all other penguins were named after it, despite being not related. But okay, if these auks were equally well adapted to the north as the penguins were to the south, then why am I just hearing about them now after taking a big deep dive into biogeography? Well, this is where the sad part comes in. I mean, why do you think I've only been showing pictures, not even photographs, but just drawings and paintings of the great auk? Any guesses? Yep, the great auk is now extinct. Now, to be fair, the great auk never achieved nearly as much success in the Arctic as the penguin experienced in the Antarctic, for the same reason that penguins failed to colonize it. Predators. Having made the same sacrifice as penguins did, giving up their wings in exchange for flippers, auks were incredibly vulnerable while on land. This defenselessness limited where great auks could congregate and breed without having their entire population decimated by just some lucky wolves or a single bear. This vulnerability meant that despite being spotted across a range including much of the North Atlantic all the way from the northeastern United States as far down as Cape Cod through the Gulf of St. Lawrence to Greenland, Iceland, the British Isles, Norway, and all along the European West Coast down to Spain, only about nine breeding grounds were ever discovered, though it's estimated that up to 20 may have existed. What this shows us is despite the Arctic seemingly being capable of hosting penguin-like species, the only places animals as vulnerable as this could actually sustain a population were the few and far between rocky islands stranded in the North Atlantic, as these were the only spots predators truly could not reach. This not only kept auk populations much smaller than penguins, but also meant they were by no means the dominant animal to be living here, and occupied a much smaller niche within the animal community. However, arctic predators had been present for the entire history of the great auk, from their evolution as a flying seabird all the way into becoming the penguins of the north. So, while natural predation may have been the reason why auks weren't nearly as widespread as their southern counterparts, it could not have been the reason behind their eventual extinction. Well, in that case, you must be wondering then what did cause the demise of the great auk. But come on, you already know. Humans. Another similarity between the great auk and penguins was their astounding resilience to the cold, which in no small part was due to their amazingly dense coat of feathers. It was only a matter of time before people realized they could use auk pelts to keep themselves warm, and all of a sudden an adaptation made to keep the auks alive became the quality that ultimately led to their destruction. I wonder if there's a lesson to be learned there. Anyway, the hunting of auks was not only profitable, but easy, given their less than impressive ability to move around on land, and continued until people started to recognize that they were becoming harder and harder to find. So what did the people of the time do? Did they stop hunting them in an attempt to let their population recover? Did they establish protected conservation areas to at least allow some of them to breed in peace? Did they collect a bunch of living ox and just try to keep them alive in captivity? Did they do anything that would have helped whatsoever? Of course not. Instead, the increasing rarity of the bird only made them more valuable as now all the museums of Europe and individual collectors began racing to obtain specimens of not only the birds but also their eggs before it was too late, consequently only speeding up the demise of the species. 
By the year 1800, of the nine rookeries known to have existed, only four still had auk populations. By 1844, only a single small island off the southwest coast of Iceland called Elde hosted a population of ox. And when I say small island, I mean it. This is Elde, a rock no bigger than 3 hectares in area where no more than 50 ox were known to nest. And it would be here that the number would eventually drop to zero. The fact that the birds had disappeared literally everywhere else didn't seem to bother anyone though, and people continued visiting the island and leaving with their treasured pelts and eggs until just a single breeding pair was left on the island. Years later, a man named John Woolley investigated the disappearance of the Great Auk, or what he called Gerfal, and he actually managed to interview some of the men who supposedly ventured to the island for the last time. And I would like us to read an excerpt from this. In this expedition, but three men ascended. John Branson, a son of the former leader who had several times before visited the rock, with Sigurther Islifsson and Kettle Kettleson. A fourth, who was called upon to assist, refused. So dangerous did the landing seem. As the men I have named clambered up, they saw two gerfowls sitting among the numberless other rock birds, and at once gave chase. The gerfowls showed not the slightest disposition to repel the invaders, but immediately ran along under the high cliff their heads erect, their little wings somewhat extended. They uttered no cry of alarm and moved with their short steps, about as quickly as a man could walk. John, with outstretched arms, drove one into a corner, where he soon had it fast. Sigurther and Kettle pursued the second, and the former seized it close to the edge of the rock. Here risen to a precipice some fathoms high, the water being directly below it. Kettle then returned to the sloping shelf whence the birds had started, and saw an egg lying on the lava slab, which he knew to be a gerfowl's. He took it up, but finding it was broken, put it down again. What I tell you, I wasn't joking when I said this was the sad explanation. It turns out the answer to our question, why aren't there any penguins in the Arctic, is simple. There were, and we just killed them all. But you see, as horrible of a story as this is, that's what makes the story worth telling. Us humans are capable of astounding degrees of destruction, sometimes without even being aware of it. And so the more we learn and come to realize our destructive capacities, the more we can try to avoid them. Just like dodos, the great auk was a victim of its own isolation, and it's likely that penguins would have seen the same fate, if not for their extreme isolation, on the one continent humans have still refused to colonize. Okay, well, I know what you must be wondering by now. If the Arctic was in fact capable of hosting what were essentially penguins, then why don't we step in and introduce penguins directly from the south to the north, effectively bypassing all the natural barriers keeping them out? I mean, we could even put them in the places we knew auks had success in before, where predators can't reach. Not only might this, I don't know, somehow right the wrong that humans inflicted on the area some 200 years ago, but also add back a missing link in the food chain. To be honest, I have no doubt in my mind that penguins could adapt to this new environment. Heck, give them enough time and it's likely they would even eventually speciate into their very own breed of northern penguin. So then why don't we do it? Well, besides the potential for unforeseen consequences which always exist when dealing with natural systems like this, there is one definite impact penguins would have on our environment that we really wouldn't like. They'd eat. Being excellent aquatic hunters, penguins would feast on the very same fish that many northern countries rely on to feed themselves, and we'd end up competing against them. After a while, people would start to see the birds as a pest. Don't believe me? Well, too bad. This is already what's happening in countries like Chile, South Africa, and Australia, where fishermen already share waters with penguins, much to the detriment of the local penguin populations, many of which now have become endangered as a result. Ultimately, although the potential for biodiversity on this planet is greater than what many of us can even imagine, we often forget that there are limits to life as well. While freezing cold temperatures, vast expanses of ice, and excessively predatory animals may have all been huge challenges to animals in the past, more and more we'll find the greatest obstacle in modern times to be ourselves. No matter how you look at it, we are the reason there are no penguins or anything close to penguins in the Arctic. 
Hey everyone, I hope you've all been enjoying this island biogeography series so far. Next up we have a much less depressing but equally fascinating story about how all these principles have played out in a time different from our own. So stay tuned and subscribe if you don't want to miss it. A three video project like this is something I'd only have confidence doing with the support of my patrons. So if you want to see more trilogies like this, you can click on the link on screen to head over to my Patreon. Besides that, yeah, okay, give the video a like, hit the notification bell, oh yeah, and click right here to watch the first video in this series if you haven't already. Thanks!